Hello, boys and girls. Welcome back to another chapter, actually two chapters of Skinny Bones this time. Recapping chapter four. We learned that Alex isn't a very tall kid. He's actually the smallest kid on his team year after year after year. And whenever they have Little League practice at the beginning of the season, they order uniforms. He's always the smallest one. So this year he thought he could try to order a large and not feel so small, but that didn't work out. Pretty funny story so far. Let's see what happens. Chapter 5. TJ Stoner brags about his baseball team more than any kid I've ever known in my whole life. So what if his team hasn't lost a game all year? Doesn't mean they've won just because of TJ. Everyone knows that one kid can't make the difference between a winning team and a losing team. After all, every team I've ever been on has come in last place. And I don't care what anyone says. All those teams didn't lose just because of me. This year, I happen to know that I am not the worst player on my team. The worst player on my team is Ryan Brady. Ryan doesn't help us out at all. The very first game of the season, Ryan broke his arm. No, all, all he does is sit on the bench. I sure, I'm sure I help the team out a lot more than Ryan. I play center field. A lot of kids think that if you play in the outfield, it means you stink. My father says that's ridiculous. He says that outfielders are just as important as infielders. He told me that when he was a boy, he played in the outfield just like me. But that doesn't make me feel much better. I've seen my father play baseball. He stinks. My mother says that when people like TJ Stoner brag, it's just because they're trying to get attention. And as usual, she says to ignore them. But for some reason, whenever I hear TJ start to brag about his baseball team, I just can't seem to keep my mouth shut. One day, a couple of weeks ago, I heard him talking to a bunch of kids out in the playground. <clears throat> my coach told me that for a kid, I was the best pitcher he had ever seen in his life, he said. When I heard that, I did a very dumb thing. I called over to my friend, Brian Dunlop, Hey, Brian, I shouted. I forgot to tell you. Last night at baseball practice, my coach let me pitch. And boy, was he impressed. He said that I threw the fastest ball he had ever seen. I know it was a ridiculous thing to say, but Brian sure wasn't much help. When he heard what I was saying, he fell on the ground and started laughing. I guess I really couldn't blame him, though. Brian has seen me throw. Pretty soon, TJ came strolling over. He bent over to talk to Brian. Did I hear Skinny Bones say that he can throw a fastball? Brian couldn't stop laughing loud enough to answer, so he just nodded his head. TJ stood up and walked over to where I was standing. Hey, Frankovich, he said, I'll make you a deal. Gee, I'm sorry, TJ, I answered, shaking my head. If you're going to try and get me to come pitch for your team, you're too late. The Yankees already called me this morning. Brian let out another wild scream of laughter. TJ joined him. I guess the idea of me pitching was even funnier than I thought. One time I tried pitching with my dad, but it really didn't work out very well. Most of the balls I threw didn't even make it to the plate. Eight of them bounced in the dirt. The only ball that made it over the plate beamed him on the head. What kind of stupid pitch was that? shouted my father as he rubbed his head. I call it my own my old bean ball, I shouted back. I guess he wasn't in the mood for jokes that day. We packed up our stuff and went home. Anyway, after TJ finally stopped laughing about my big offer from the Yankees, he started bugging me again. Come on, Alex, he, he begged. Just listen to me. What do you got to lose? By this time, a bunch of kids had started to gather around us. I think most of them had come over to see what was wrong with Brian. Because he's still laughing on the ground. Okay, TJ, I said. Tell me your deal, but make it snappy. It's almost time for Brian to massage my pitching arm. Okay, said TJ. This is it. Since we're both such good pitchers, let's hold a contest right after school to see who's the best. We'll even get a couple of kids to be the official umpires. What do you say, Frankovich? Is it a deal or not? Jeez, what a mess I was in. 
If I said no, everyone would think I was a chicken. But if I said yes, everyone would be able to see how badly I pitched. I just had to get out of it. I thought about it for a couple of minutes before I answered. Gee, I really love to, TJ, I answered finally. But my coach told me not to tire my arm out by being in any weird pitching contests. But thanks anyway. I started to walk away, but TJ grabbed me by the shoulders. You get one of your friends, Frankovich, and I'll get one of mine. They will be the umps. I'll meet you at the Little League field after school. If you're not there, we'll all know it's just because you're chicken. As he turned to walk away, he stopped and looked back at me. Be there, creephead, he shouted. After he was gone, I looked down at Brian. He was still on the ground. Hey, Brian, I said. How would you like to be an umpire this afternoon? Brian nodded his head. I think his sides were still hurting from all that laughing. I reached my hand out to help him up. Together, we started back to class. <laughs> Jeez, Brian, I said. If you think this is funny, wait till you see me pitch. Then both of us started laughing. I figured I'd better laugh now while I had the chance. Chapter 6 I was hoping the afternoon would drag on and on. But before I knew it, the three o'clock bell rang. My teacher, Mrs. Grayson, dismissed the class. I didn't want to go. Listen, Mrs. Grayson, I said as she was getting ready to leave. How would you like some help cleaning the boards and erasers this afternoon? No, thanks, Alex, she replied. I've got a meeting to go to. Mrs. Grayson, I said, tried to sound shocked. I'm surprised at you. Do you mean to tell me that you are actually going to leave the room looking like a pig pen? Please, Alex, she replied. No jokes, okay? I'm really in a hurry. She held the door open for me to leave. Exactly what kind of meeting are you going to, Mrs. Grayson? I asked. It's just a teacher's meeting, Alex. That's, that's all. But I don't want to be late. So let's go, huh? Listen, Mrs. Grayson, I continued. How would you like it if I came along with you? That way, if the meeting got real boring, we could play tic-tac-toe or something. Mrs. Grayson stopped rushing me out the door. Alex, is there some reason that you don't want to leave school today, she asked. Are you in some sort of trouble? Trouble? Me? I answered. Oh, no, Mrs. Grayson, not me. I was just trying to make your meeting a little more fun, that's all. Well... Thanks anyway, she said, but I think I'll be able to stay awake today. Okay, have it your own way, I said. But don't say I didn't try to help. I guess I'll just be heading on home now, Mrs. Grayson. That is, unless you'd like me to stick around until after your meeting is over to help you erase the boards. I think Mrs. Grayson was getting a little annoyed with me. Go home, Alex, she shouted. So I did. I went home and got my ball and glove. Then I called Brian and told him to meet me at the Little League field. By the time I got there, everyone else was already waiting for the contest to begin. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone. There must have been about a million kids standing around waiting for me to make a big fool out of myself. Hey, Frankovich, shouted TJ when he saw me coming. For a minute there, I didn't think you were going to show up. What took you so long? Were you home plucking your feathers? I think this was his way of calling me a chicken. A turkey like you probably knows a lot about feathers, TJ, I shouted back. A few of the kids standing around started to laugh, but TJ wasn't one of them. He walked over to me. This is what we're going to do, Frankovich, he began seriously. I brought along a catcher. He'll be catching for both of us. I looked over at the kid in the catcher's mask. It was Hank Grover, one of TJ's best friends. Not fair! Not fair! I pro protested. I should have gotten to bring my own catcher, too. What difference does it make who catches, he asked. The catcher isn't going to call balls and strikes. The umpires are going to do that. And besides, Alex, he added, none of your jerky little friends knows how to catch. Boy, did that ever make me mad, insulting my friends like that. I probably should have punched him right in the mouth. Except for one tiny little problem. He was right. 
none of none of my jerky friends can catch. Okay, TJ continued. We're each going to pitch ten balls. Your umpire and my umpire will stand together behind home plate. Then, as each ball is thrown, they will decide whether it's a strike or a ball. And to make it fair, the umpires have to agree on every call. If they can't agree, the pitcher takes the whole thing over again. Does that seem fair to you, Frankovich? Yeah, I guess so, I said. By this time, I was getting nervous. All I really wanted to do was go home. TJ took a dime out of his pocket. We'll flip to see who gets to pitch first, he said. Gee, I'm really sorry, TJ, I said. But I guess we won't be able to have this contest after all. I never learned how to flip. Maybe we could just somersault to see who goes first. Very funny. Now, heads or tails? He yelled as he threw the coin in the air. Tummies! I hollered, trying to look very serious. Listen, Alex! He yelled, knock off the funny stuff. Now, I'm going to toss this up one more time. Heads or tails? He shouted again. I called tails. It was heads. A bad sign. Okay, said TJ. I won the toss, so I'll go first. He took his ball and glove to the pitcher's mound. TJ's umpire, Eddie Fowler, and my umpire, Brian, took their places behind home plate. I hated to admit it, but having two umpires really did seem very fair. The trouble was, it seemed a little too fair. Before TJ started pitching, I decided to have a little talk with Brian, so I called him over. Listen, Brian, I said, just because TJ Stoner happens to be the very best pitcher that we have ever seen does not mean that he's perfect. So, whatever you do, don't be afraid to call one of his pitches a ball if you really think it's a ball. And I don't want, to, want you to think that I would ever try to get you to cheat or anything, but keep in mind that I will be glad to pay you a dime for every ball you call. TJ saw me standing and talking to Brian and shouted, Hey, Alex, don't bother trying to get Brian to cheat for you. I told him before you got here that if I caught him cheating, I'd break his face. Brian looked at me and smiled. Sorry, Alex, he said, but I think I'd rather keep my face than make a couple of lousy dimes. I was doomed. TJ was all set. I'm ready, he shouted. Ready? I yelled back. Aren't we going to even get a couple of uh, practice pitches or anything? You can practice if you need to, Frankovich, he hollered, but I don't really want any. TJ went into his windup. Some kids look dumb when they're winding up, but TJ looked just like Steve Carlton. Steve Carlton was a very great pitcher, 30 and 40 years ago. He, he played for the Twins for a year or two, too. Then he threw. The ball hit the catcher's mitt at about 60 miles an hour. But even worse, it hit his glove exactly in the center. Strike one, shouted both umpires together. TJ didn't even blink an eye. He just got ready to throw the next pitch. Strike two, shouted the umpires as the second pitch crossed the middle of the plate. This time, TJ looked over in my direction and smiled. I leaned down and pretended I was tying my shoe so I wouldn't have to look at him. What's the matter, Alex? He shouted. Is the uh, ball flying so fast that it's untying your shoes? Then he laughed and got ready for his third pitch. As usual, it was perfect. The guy was really beginning to make me sick. Every single pitch he threw came whizzing by over the plate so fast you could hardly even see it. The catcher never even had to move a muscle. The ball hit the center of his mitt ten times straight. It was really disgusting. Okay, skinny bones, he yelled after he'd thrown his last pitch. It's your turn. As TJ sat down on the sidelines, Brian walked over and patted me on the back. <laughs> Some friend you are, Brian. I said angrily. What's the matter? Did you forget how to say the word ball? Oh, get off it, Alex, he answered. All his pitches were perfect. You really didn't expect me to cheat, did you? Great, Brian, I said. I'll remember how you feel about cheating the next time you need help on a math test. Don't cheat, boys and girls. Then I grabbed my glove and slowly walked out to the pitcher's mound. 
I was hoping that maybe if I walked slowly enough, it would be dark by the time I got there and everyone would have to go home for supper. But unfortunately, when I got to the mound, the sun was still shining. There was no getting out of it now. I took a deep breath and turned around. Oh no. It was a lot farther to home plate than I remembered. I began to panic. I can't throw all the way from here. I thought to myself, I'm so far away. The two umpires look tiny. Just then the two umpires stood up. Whew, that was a close one. They must have sat down when they saw how long it was taking for me to get to, out to the mound. The umpires lined up behind home plate and the catcher got set. Are you ready yet, skinny bones? Yelled TJ. Or do you want to practice first? Aha. The perfect opportunity to stall for time. Slowly, I walked off the mound and headed for TJ on the sidelines. As soon as I got there, he stood up. I stood on tiptoe and tried to look him in the eye. For your information, TJ, I said, trying to act tough, there is nothing skinny about my bones, so I would appreciate it if you would stop calling me by that stupid name. TJ grabbed hold of my arm and held it up next to his. If your bones aren't skinny, he said, then why is my arm so much bigger than yours? You've got fat skin, I said simply. TJ's eyes started getting real squinty. That means he was about to hit me, so I hurried back out to the mound before he had a chance. I stood there for a few minutes trying to figure out how to begin my wind-up. But pretty soon, some of the kids started shouting at me to hurry up, so finally, I was forced to begin. I pulled my glove back toward my chest and stared at the catcher's mitt. Then I raised my left leg high in the air and hopped on my right foot. Both umpires started to giggle. The catcher fell right over in the dirt laughing. They didn't even give me a chance to throw. Time out, I yelled. No fair interference on the umpires and the catcher. For once in his life, TJ seemed to agree with me. He went over and tried to get the three of them to calm down. It took a few minutes, but finally they got themselves under control. Once again, I went into my windup. I pulled my glove back to my chest, raised my left leg high into the air, hopped on my right foot, and let the ball go. I watched carefully as it rolled all the way to the plate. Wow, I thought to myself, what a pitch. It was a little low, of course, but at least I had it going in the right direction. Ball one, shouted both umpires together. Well, I guess that's it, TJ, I called as I walked off the mound. I lost. One little mistake on my first pitch, and it's all over. There's no way I can win or even tie your, pi your pitching record when I've already got one ball. It's really a shame, too. That's probably the only bad pitch I'd have thrown all day. Not so fast, Frankovich, screamed TJ, running after me. He caught up to me and grabbed me by the collar. You have nine more balls to throw, hot shot. We had a deal. So get back to that mound and we'll just see how good you are. I knew there was no sense trying to argue with him, so slowly I turned around and headed back. Maybe there's still some hope, I thought. If only I could throw a couple of good solid strikes, just one or two, at least I wouldn't end up looking like such an idiot. I took a deep breath and got ready to throw my second pitch. My windup was the same, but something terrible happened when I started to throw. As I took the ball behind the head, it slipped out of my hand and landed in the dirt three feet behind me. By this time, I had really had it. All I wanted to do was get the whole thing over with quickly so I could just go home. Brian had fallen in the dirt laughing. His mouth formed the words, ball two, but nothing came out. I wound up and threw my third pitch as hard as I could. TJ was still watching from the sidelines. Unfortunately, my aim was a little bit off and the ball hit him on the arm. Strike one, I shouted myself. TJ came running over, holding his arm. What do you mean, strike one, he demanded, grabbing my shirt. Well, it struck you, didn't it? I said, giggling. Let's see how you like being struck, skinny bones, he yelled, punching my arm as hard as he could. 
Just remember what this feels like the next time you wanted to hit me with a ball, he growled. Sometime, or somehow I got the feeling this contest was over. My arm was a goner. It just hung limp at my side like it had croaked or something. I checked it out to see if it was bleeding, but no such luck. I don't like that. When something hurts as bad as my arm did, the least it could do was bleed a little. As TJ walked away, a lot of the kids started running after him. Most of them were patting him on the arm and telling him what a great pitcher he was. It's a good thing I didn't win. If anyone had patted me on my arm, I'm sure it would have fallen right off into the dirt. I waited around a few minutes to walk home with Brian, but he must have left home without me. At first, I was mad about it, but in a way, I understood. I guess he was just too embarrassed to walk home with a loser. I knew exactly how he felt. I didn't want to walk home with me either. Bummer. Let's hope we get some good news in the next chapter.